Hi, I'm David Fairweather, currently a teacher of physics and head of theory of knowledge at Aiglon College, an international school in Switzerland that follows the International Baccalaureate program. It's a pleasure to talk for Chat Physics Live 2021. And this session is aimed primarily at those teaching physics within the International Baccalaureate, the IB curriculum. A lot of the elements of this will also be applicable to A-level or AP teachers as well. So I've been teaching theory of knowledge for five years now. And without a doubt, I've become a better physics teacher as a result. Physics teachers are great at theory of knowledge because physics is inherently about theory of knowledge. This is after all a subject which is founded on doubt of those that have come before. The assumption that everything that's come before is at least a little bit wrong. Now, if you're a teacher who reads physics books from the likes of Carlo Rovelli, uh, Stephen Hawking, Jim Al-Khalili, then you get TOK. And for the rest of this talk, I'll, I'll call it TOK, never talk. As I've started explicitly bringing up TOK links in lessons, the students have begun to make better connections between subjects and they now ask deeper and more involved questions in my physics lessons. Additionally, I'm convinced teaching TOK has made me a better physics teacher. Okay, we'll start introducing what TOK is. So TOK aims to get students interrogating knowledge and appreciating how knowledge is produced, understanding the processes behind the production of knowledge. In a knowledge rich curriculum, such as the IB, such as A-level, such as AP, building that TOK into lessons helps students better understand where that knowledge we're providing them with fits inside a bigger context. One of the words we've heard more and more in the last year or so in education is hinterland. The idea that building time to address and signpost the context and wider issues surrounding knowledge is as important as the core knowledge that we teach. Both Tom Sherrington and Adam Boxer have blogged brilliantly on this, both referencing Christine Council's writing. I absolutely recommend looking that up if you haven't encountered uh, hinterland as an idea. Now for the IB teacher, Integrating TOK into your lessons is exactly that hinterland, but it's giving the students somewhere to take and further discuss and think about those hinterland ideas. So as a TOK teacher, for me, the idea would be that subject teachers are signposting the TOK concepts uh, during those hinterland conversations that crop up in their lessons. And students are leaving those lessons and bringing those bigger questions back to my TOK lessons, ready to discuss those in different contexts. So what we're really looking for are those stories, those questions in particular that arise during the physics course that we can use to extract bigger questions about knowledge and send the students away with a better appreciation of the questions about knowledge relating to the subject and how they may relate to other subjects. As physics teachers, we are TOK teachers. The key to really getting TOK is to identify links between specific examples and bigger questions about knowledge. Now, if we were doing this in person, I would send you away in groups now to identify knowledge uh, questions, bring those back together and discuss them. But what we'll do now is I'm going to introduce a few classic physics TOK examples I'll whiz through them really quickly and encourage you to go away and think about some more afterwards. So here we've got the classic TOK example in physics, a simple circuit. Now, we would teach that there's a conventional current that flows around the circuit. Most of us have probably at some point dodged the question then at IB, had to reluctantly address the idea that electrons flow in the opposite direction to conventional current. Students will ask all the time, why isn't current defined as the direction that electrons move, given that that's the most common example of a current? Well, ultimately that goes back to current being defined before the discovery of the electron. 
So this is historical. It can't be undone now. If we were starting from scratch with naming and defining everything, we might define current as the direction in which electrons move. But because current was defined before it was understood, we've defined it in an awkward direction. Now, this is a really brilliant place to bring in TOK questions. Is it important for explanations to accurately describe what's happening? Now, when we teach at GCSE level, for instance, we need to know electrons are moving around the circuit. We don't really address the direction in which they're traveling. Right? Does labeling things before we really understand them hinder our understanding? And is it possible to fully understand anything without naming it? So these are three questions we could extract from that conversation about electrical current. So rather than being an awkward conversation to have, it's a really interesting conversation to have and one that we can send students away with questions to take to their TOK classes. So here's another example, magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are a really rich vein for us to, to mine for TOK concepts. Now we have all drawn magnetic field diagrams. We've got students drawing these field lines, putting arrows on them. We've identified that where those field lines are closest together, that the magnet is strongest, you've got strongest magnetic field there. We've used concepts like magnetic flux and magnetic flux density, all based on these, this idea of field lines, but these lines don't exist, they're a representation. Flux density is a fascinating concept because it's defined in terms of field lines per area, but those field lines don't exist. There are no lines around that magnet. They're a representation of the shape the field takes. This is fantastic. This is, we can extract some great questions from this and send the students away with those questions. So asking to what extent visual representations of abstract concepts can produce reliable knowledge is fantastic. Or we could flip that around and say, are there ideas which we are unable to comprehend without a visual representation? And from that point, you can then go further and say, well, what about ideas that it's impossible to represent visually? Does that mean it's impossible for us to understand? Questions about multiple dimensions would fit into this. So from that one example of a magnetic field, we've extracted some really quite big questions that can be related to all of science. And we can send students back to their TOK lessons with these questions to share with their classes. Another example is models. We use models all the time in science and, and that's something that students don't always understand. Now this quote here from George Box is, it's written about economics, but the idea that all models are wrong, but some are useful equally applies to science. Now with models of the atom, we've got a beautiful representation of how asking questions and using models has allowed our understanding to develop over time. So we can go right back to the start and talk about the idea that an unbreakable piece must exist through to Dalton's atom, Thompson's plum pudding model, the Rutherford atom, the Bohr atom and quantized energy levels. We talk about Schrodinger, Heisenberg uncertainty, um, the discovery of the neutron through to quarks and gluons. Each of those models of the atom has been useful. Some of those models of the atom are still taught as useful models at stages in chemistry and physics. And this brings up loads of interesting questions. If all models are ultimately likely to be wrong, why do we use models? Or can we understand anything without having models? So a couple of classic TOK knowledge questions we can extract from this. Given that all models are likely wrong, to what extent do models produce knowledge which is valid? Is it reasonable to teach a model of reality 
that you know to be flawed? And if so, when? Now we all teach models of reality that we know to be flawed. This is a brilliant conversation to have with students. And again, it's a bigger question we can extract from our physics. Right, so we've seen three quick examples there of how classic conversations in physics can lead to big questions about knowledge, really classic TOK questions. There's loads more and you'll find loads more just by thinking about some of the conversations you have in physics with your students. I'm going to talk briefly now about assessment in TOK. Now, if you teach in an IB school, then in the second year of the IB diploma, your students will be writing a TOK essay, 1600 words answering one of six prescribed titles. These are the prescribed titles for the 2021 exam session. So each of these questions is a statement about knowledge which students had to discuss with reference to two areas of knowledge. In terms of the IB, an area of knowledge that concerns us is the natural sciences. Physics falls within that and physics is perfect for answering any of these questions actually. I'm not going to discuss all of these. I'm going to discuss particularly question three, which is a question about labels and how those relate to knowledge. Right, so this question says, labels are a necessity in the organization of knowledge, but they also constrain our understanding. Now, what we're looking for here are examples from physics where we can show that labels are essential, maybe some examples where they're not essential. Examples of them constraining our understanding and examples where they don't. These are what students are looking for. And chances are, if you're teaching in IB school, your students will have come to you and asked these kinds of questions already. So let's have a look. We could talk about that example we mentioned earlier, the labeling of electrical currents. We could say actually labeling currents the way we have has constrained our understanding because it's confusing. Maybe the classic TOK uh, example that crops up in physics is wave particle duality. Now, chances are your TOK teachers in your school will have mentioned wave particle duality, but probably don't understand it as well as you do. So there's a good argument here that the use of the labels wave and particle is the cause of much of the confusion around the behavior of light. A student could argue that if we hadn't labeled light with the particle or wave uh, description, then there wouldn't be the confusion and the misconceptions around the idea of duality. Equally, we could say, if we hadn't labeled them, potentially we'd have no understanding at all about light. So are those labels, wave and particle a necessity, or are they constraining our understanding? Or is it both? This is anecdotal, but I found that when students do talk about physics in their extended essays or in their TOK essays, they take more ownership of their subject. There's pride in it. They take a lot of joy in being somewhat of an expert. And they come. it comes at a time when they're tired, they want their exams to be over, and it breathes new life into that. Seeing how the subject links into bigger areas, how they can answer bigger questions by talking about physics has sparked another level of interest uh, in my experience. So I'm running out of time there. So I'm going to just leave you with a few top tips for using TOK uh, in, as a physics teacher. So the first of those is to talk to your TOK department. Often in schools, the TOK department is a quirky little department that is seen as peripheral to everything else. In fact, it should be core to everything. Uh, find those teachers, talk to them, find out when they teach different bits in the TOK syllabus, find out when they're teaching about natural sciences. Do they want you to come and give a guest lecture about natural science? Talk to your students about TOK, about their exhibitions, which, which I haven't mentioned here, and their essays. Ask about what science examples they're introducing into those. 
And the best tip I can give you as a physics teacher is to volunteer to teach some TOK. As a physics teacher, you are a really good TOK teacher. So if your timetable allows, get some TOK lessons in your timetable. I think it gives you a brilliant break from the repetitive nature of some of the physics, and it gives you a really in-depth understanding of physics, which you can pass on to your students. That's all I've got time for there. I could talk about TOK for hours, talk about physics for hours. So please do feel free to get in touch if you've got questions or comments. My email's there, as is uh, my Twitter. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk for Chat Physics Live 2021. Thank you very much for listening.